Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by rosaryarmy.com have more peace visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary downloadable audio rosaries and more make them pray them give them away at rosaryarmy.com and by whole mission marquette method natural family planning services unveil the mystery of you and your spouse's combined fertility using an evidence-based highly effective and moral way of avoiding or achieving pregnancy discover more from a licensed healthcare professional at mmnfp.com previously on jimmy aiken's mysterious world from abc news 2020 continues once again barbara walters it is one of the most bizarre medical mysteries in recent memory, and doctors still can't explain it. It happened two weeks ago in a Southern California emergency room. A team of medical workers collapsed, apparently after inhaling fumes coming from the body of a dying woman. One of the victims is a doctor, and tonight our doctor, Timothy Johnson, visits her in the hospital where she's still recovering to find out what happened. You're listening to episode 155 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the medical mystery of Gloria Ramirez, the so-called toxic lady. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, be sure to stick around for the end of the episode. We're going to have your feedback, which consists of some fan art. It's it's you can't you don't want to miss this. It's going to be awesome. So uh, stick around for that. But first, in 1994, a young woman was rushed to an emergency room in Southern California. When she arrived, the emergency room staff gave her an IV and drew her blood. And that's when bizarre things started to happen. So bizarre that they inspired part of an episode of The X-Files. Who was this young woman, Gloria Ramirez? What happened to the hospital staff? And what could possibly explain the strange events that happened? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what do we need to say before we begin? Unfortunately, this story does involve a tragic death, so we won't be able to give a happy ending where everyone goes home okay. But death is a fact of life, and we always treat it with respect and in a clinical manner that doesn't dwell on the details. This time, we're looking at a medical mystery, so we will be talking about medicine and chemistry, but don't worry, this will be very clinical, and we won't be getting into gross details. In fact, we'll be dealing with certain things in a much milder way than the X-Files did. So if you and your family can handle the X-Files, you'll be able to handle this. Which episode of the X-Files did this mystery inspire? It's the season finale of the first season of the show, an episode called The Erlenmeyer Flask. In this episode, Mulder gets kidnapped, Scully retrieves a frozen alien embryo from a government lab to exchange for his life, and Mulder's original ally, Deep Throat, played by Jerry Harden, is shot and killed. It originally aired on May 13th, 1994, and when it did... I was shocked because I was watching it and I immediately recognized that it incorporated events that had happened near me in Southern California less than two months previously. The timeline was so tight that they must have had this episode already in development and then included the scenes based on the Gloria Ramirez event at the last minute while production was underway. Let's talk about the woman at the center of the mystery. Who was Gloria Ramirez? She was born in 1963, and in February of 1994, she had just turned 31 years old. She grew up in Riverside, which is a city in Southern California that's between Los Angeles and San Diego. San Diego is in the far south, down near the Mexican border, and Los Angeles is further north. Between them is Riverside, which has about 300,000 people living there. Gloria was a single mother with two children, a daughter who was 15 and a son who was 12. According to an article in New Times L.A., Ramirez lived a quiet and remarkable life. She volunteered at her children's schools, cooked and decorated hair barrettes in her spare time. 
Quick with a smile and a good talker, she made friends easily. She grew up in Riverside, one of three children in a tight-knit Mexican-American family. Her father was a car mechanic, her mother a homemaker. A high school dropout, Ramirez was unmarried and on welfare in February 1994. She had held various jobs over the years, occasionally working in fast food restaurants. But she also was engaged to be married to a man that she'd met and fallen in love with, so she was looking forward to that. However, in late 1993, she started feeling unwell and began losing weight. Around the end of the year, she found out why. She was diagnosed with cancer, which was already in an advanced state, despite the fact that she was a very young woman. And that's something I can really understand, because my wife, Renee, had died the previous year of cancer in 1992, when she was only 27 years old. So despite the fact that cancer normally strikes older people and normally progresses at a slow rate, in rare cases, it can also strike young people and progress at a faster rate. Gloria planned to start chemotherapy treatment, and although it didn't look like she would be able to make a full recovery, it apparently was expected that the chemo could significantly extend her life. What happened on the night of February 19th, 1994? February 19th was a Saturday night, and Gloria wasn't feeling well. She was experiencing nausea, had been throwing up, and complained of breathing problems. She also was having heart palpitations. Palpitations can take many forms, but in her case, it meant that she could feel her heart racing really fast. At some point, she decided that she was feeling so bad that they called the paramedics. When the paramedics came, they took her to Riverside General Hospital, and when she arrived at 8.15 p.m., she was conscious and talking, but she was confused. Her heart was racing, and she was exhibiting an abnormal breathing rhythm known as Cheney-Stokes respiration. This breathing rhythm sometimes occurs when a person's heart isn't effectively pumping blood, and that fits with her racing heartbeat, because if the heart beats too fast, it isn't able to fully fill up with blood before it contracts. As a result, it only sends out small amounts of blood which aren't enough to nourish the body, and that results in dangerously low blood pressure. And that could cause the weird breathing rhythm, as well as the confusion she was exhibiting since her brain wasn't getting enough blood. What did the emergency room staff do once she arrived at the hospital? They immediately administered several fast-acting drugs to sedate her and try to calm down her racing heart. However, these did not quickly produce the desired effect, so they decided to defibrillate her in an attempt to reset her heart to a more normal rhythm. When they were preparing for the defibrillation, they noticed that she had what looked like an oily sheen on her skin. Some also noticed a strange aroma that smelled like fruit mixed with garlic that they thought was coming from her mouth. One of the nurses attending her, Susan Kane, inserted an intravenous tube and then started to draw blood from Gloria's arm, but noticed an ammonia-like smell coming from the tube. Nurse Kane passed the syringe of blood to one of the doctors present, a resident named Dr. Julie Gorchinsky, who saw something really strange. In addition to blood, the syringe contained small crystals. Others who were present, including Dr. Umberto Ochoa, the physician who was in charge of the effort to help Gloria, also saw the crystals. According to the available reports, the crystals in the syringe were either manila-colored, meaning light brown and possibly yellowish-brown, or they were white. As the TV news magazine 2020 reported a couple of weeks later, To add to the mystery, Dr. Umberto Ochoa, who was not affected, noticed white crystals in the blood. I don't know what it could possibly have been. From the different pieces of eyewitness testimony, it's somewhat difficult to determine exactly what happened and in exactly what order, but the general picture is clear. According to Discover magazine, Nurse Kane turned toward the door of the trauma room and swayed. Catch her, someone shouted. Dr. Ochoa lunged for Kane, caught her, and gently guided her limp body to the floor. Kane said that her face was burning and she was put on a gurney and taken from trauma one. Dr. Gorchinsky, too, began feeling queasy, complaining that she was lightheaded. She left the trauma room and sat at a nurse's desk. A staff member asked Gorchinsky if she was okay, but before she could respond, she slumped to the floor. She was now the second member of the Riverside Emergency Room staff being wheeled away from the trauma room on a gurney. Gorchinsky shook intermittently. Over and over again, she would stop breathing for several seconds, take a few breaths, then stop breathing again. 
a condition known as apnea. Later, Dr. Gorchinsky wouldn't remember all of this, but from her hospital bed, she said, I asked the nurse to start an IV that about coincidentally at the same time I smelt, you know, ammonia. To me it was ammonia. And I kind of made a comment that, you know, that's really strong ammonia. And I kind of felt, you know, like I was going to pass out then. So I moved around to the other side of the bed to get away from the fumes. And in retrospect, which I shouldn't have done, I smelt the blood. And a few seconds later, I wasn't feeling good myself. And just remember waking up, being helped to be breathed with a mask. And the situation was about to claim its third victim, a respiratory therapist named Maureen Welch. Meanwhile, back in Trauma 1, Welch became the third to succumb. I remember hearing someone scream, Welch says. Then when I woke up, I couldn't control the movements of my limbs. At this point, three members of the emergency room staff, Nurse Kane, Dr. Gruchinsky, and Maureen Welch, were down. Several other staff members also reported that they were starting to feel ill. Something was obviously seriously wrong. It was possible that a dangerous gas or other substance had been released into the emergency room of Riverside General Hospital. The doctors on hand had an obligation to protect the other patients who were there, and not knowing where the toxin was or what it might be, Dr. Ochoa ordered the staff to move everybody in the emergency room all of the patients and almost all the staff out into the open air in the parking lot. At least in the parking lot, they had less of a chance of being harmed by whatever had been released in the closed environment of the emergency room. Meanwhile, Dr. Ochoa and a small number of staffers stayed to try to help stabilize Gloria. Word went out over the radio to start diverting ambulances to other nearby hospitals, since it obviously wasn't safe to bring them to Riverside General. Inside the emergency room, Dr. Ochoa and his small team continued to try to save Gloria's life. But despite the CPR and defibrillation they gave Gloria, they couldn't save her. At 8.50 p.m., just 35 minutes after she arrived at Riverside General Hospital, Gloria Ramirez was pronounced dead. Outside in the parking lot, hospital staff were treating patients and ill colleagues under the dull orange glow of sulfur lamps. Because of concern that the stricken staff had been felled by a noxious chemical, they were stripped down to their underwear and their clothes were bundled into plastic bags. Dr. Gorchinsky continued to experience tremors and apnea. Nurse Kane flailed her arms and kicked, and her face still burned. Meanwhile, Sally Balderas, a vocational nurse who had gone back inside to help take Ramirez's body into the isolation room, began retching and felt a burning sensation on her skin. Soon, she was in such bad shape that she too was laid out on a gurney. All told, 23 of the 37 emergency room staffers reported experiencing symptoms, so basically two-thirds of them became ill as a result of whatever happened here. And five of them were sick enough that they were hospitalized for the rest of the night at different hospitals, since this one didn't seem to be quite safe. One of them would spend two weeks in intensive care. What was the county's reaction to what was happening at the hospital? Two hours after Gloria died at 11 p.m., the Riverside County hazmat team arrived in full protective gear. The hazmat team was after a smoking gun, some volatile toxicant that might yet be lurking in the air of the emergency room. They searched for any of a host of noxious chemicals, including hydrogen sulfide, also known as sewer gas, an insidious poison that smells like rotten eggs, and at high concentrations can kill a person after one or two whiffs, and phosgene, a gas with a dual identity, on the one hand a law-abiding ingredient used in the preparation of many organic chemicals, and on the other, a terrible weapon for chemical warfare that tears open capillaries in the lungs. To the relief of hospital administrators, the hazmat crew detected none of these chemicals in the emergency room. But the failure to find any toxic substance in the ER only deepened the mystery. The situation was particularly unnerving for the county coroner's office because they're required to investigate any suspicious deaths. That meant that they needed to perform an autopsy without their staff knowing anything about what caused the dangerous situation. They therefore contacted the California Occupational Safety and Health Administration, known as Cal OSHA. The autopsy was planned for six days later, and to avoid a media frenzy, They did it at one in the morning. 
According to New Times LA, health officials weren't taking any chances when it came time to autopsy. With the help of experts from Cal OSHA, the state worker protection agency, elaborate steps were taken to shield the pathologist and his crew from whatever strange chemicals might be lurking. Inside the ivy-covered Riverside County Coroner's Office, a special chamber was constructed so the four men would be sealed off from the rest of the world. They would wear level A protective suits, spacesuit-like gear normally used by specialists cleaning up toxic spills. Oxygen would be pumped to the autopsy workers through umbilical cords. In the event the main oxygen supply failed, they had emergency air canisters tucked inside their suits. Outside the chamber, four members of Riverside County's hazardous materials team watched the autopsy via video monitor. They too wore protective suits and were assigned to rescue those inside if problems arose. Three fire trucks were nearby, their crews ready to leap into action. The scene was like something out of a science fiction movie, and the mood was tense. More than 50 reporters had gathered for the spectacle. During a media briefing in the basement of the coroner's office, a reporter shouted to county officials, What are you afraid of? Chief Deputy Coroner Dan Capito yelled back, The unknown! As darkness fell, reporters and camera crews were herded behind a cordon of yellow police tape across the street from the coroner's office. They waited anxiously, notebooks in hand, for the autopsy to begin. The initial autopsy took 90 minutes, and afterwards, the workers were hosed off with decontaminants in the parking lot. But the autopsy didn't help much. Riverside County spokesman Ron DeSantis described the state of affairs this way. Nothing ruled in, nothing ruled out. We are still dealing with an unknown at this point. As a result, the coroner's office decided to reach out to some outside groups. One was the Forensic Science Center at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. It's famous for being a physics lab that played a key role in developing nuclear weapons, but it also has a forensics division, so they sent Livermore samples from the autopsy. Did they find anything in the samples that could explain what happened or anything unusual at all? One of the things they found was an amine. Amines are derivatives from ammonia, and the emergency room staff had reported an ammonia-like smell. The Livermore staff thought that this amine may have been produced in Gloria's body because she had been on a drug called Tygen to help control her nausea. And this could have broken down into the amine and contributed to the ammonia smell. However, there were only minute traces of the amine, and the ammonia smell had been strong. Another thing they found was nicotinamide. This is one of the forms of vitamin B3, or niacin. Another form of vitamin B3 is nicotinic acid, which is present in many niacin supplements. As people who take nutritional supplements are likely to know, you have to be careful when you take niacin. If you take a lot of nicotinic acid and your system isn't used to that much, it will cause your skin to flush and start itching. So you need to build up slowly in how much niacin you take in order to let your system adjust. Once I took too much without preparation and the next three days were a living hell. I actually thought this is giving me an insight into what hell must be like. My skin was just on fire fire with redness and itchiness. But the alternative form of the vitamin, nicotinamide, doesn't cause this. As a result, it's often marketed as no flush niacin because it doesn't cause the skin flushing. But besides its use as a nutritional supplement, nicotinamide also does other things. Discovery Magazine reports, It's also mixed into illegal drugs like methamphetamines. Since nicotinamide is relatively inexpensive and can cause euphoria, dealers can extend their expensive drugs with it and make a larger profit. It's an unusual compound for someone to be taking if they're very, very sick, says Brian Andreessen, the director of the Livermore Forensic Center. And remember the fact that nicotinamide is mixed into drugs like meth, because that will come back later. There was also a third unusual chemical they found, dimethyl sulfone. Dimethyl sulfone is a molecule composed of one sulfur atom, two carbons, six hydrogens, and two oxygens. It is manufactured as an industrial solvent, but it is also sometimes produced naturally in our bodies from amino acids that contain sulfur. Broken down by the liver, dimethyl sulfone has a half-life in the body of less than three days, so healthy people never have measurable amounts in their system. 
but in Ramirez's blood and tissues there was a hefty concentration. At this point in the mystery, the only unusual thing we're seeing is dimethyl sulfone, says Andreessen. But the dimethyl sulfone that the staff found in the samples could not have explained what happened to the ER staff. It was just weird to find it there. As a result, when Andreessen flew to Riverside on April 12th, just two months after Gloria's death, he had to tell them that he didn't find anything that looked like a poison or that could have explained what happened, which surprised everybody. The Riverside coroner's office felt it had reached the end of the road, too, at a press conference on April 29th to reveal the autopsy results. Coroner Scotty Hill announced that Ramirez had died of cardiac dysrhythmia triggered by kidney failure stemming from her cancer. The investigation into her death, Hill said, was finished. As for the illness in the hospital workers and how that might be linked to Ramirez, Hill concluded that exhaustive toxicological studies have not identified any external toxic substances that would have contributed to her death. So they had a proposed cause of death for Gloria, a failure of her heart to beat properly caused by kidney failure due to her cancer, but no explanation for what happened to the staff. Did the family accept the results of the autopsy and the proposed cause of death? No, they wanted an independent autopsy. And in April, after lengthy legal wrangling, they received Gloria's body and had an independent pathologist do a second autopsy. Unfortunately, the pathologist could not determine the cause of death because of the condition the body was in at this point, a subject we'll come back to. Faced with these disappointing results, the family buried Gloria on April 20th, 10 weeks after her death. What about the issue of what happened to the ER staff? Did the authorities just let that drop? No, instead, they started a new investigation into the question. The county health department called in California's Department of Health and Human Services, which put two of its top scientists on the case, Drs. Anna Maria Osorio and Kirsten Waller. They interviewed 34 hospital staff who had been working in the emergency room on February 19th. Using a standardized questionnaire, Osario and Waller found that the people who had developed severe symptoms, such as loss of consciousness, shortness of breath, and muscle spasms, tended to have certain things in common. Perhaps unsurprisingly, people who had worked within two feet of Ramirez and had handled her intravenous lines had been at high risk. But other factors that correlated with severe symptoms didn't seem to match a scenario in which fumes had been released. The survey found that those afflicted tended to be women rather than men, as well as people who had skipped dinner that evening rather than those who had a full stomach. This investigation went on for months, and it wasn't until September that an official report was issued. The conclusion. The hospital staff most likely experienced an outbreak of mass sociogenic illness, perhaps triggered by an odor. In other words, they'd been felled by stress and anxiety. In support of this mass hysteria theory, doctors Anna Maria Osorio and Kirsten Waller cited the lack of evidence for a poison and the fact that women were more likely to suffer severe symptoms, both hallmark signs of mass hysteria. In addition, they pointed out neither paramedic who had treated Ramirez in the ambulance became ill, despite the close quarters and their having touched her skin and some of her blood after starting an intravenous line. However, Osaria and Waller did not rule out the possibility that some substance poisoned emergency room staff who had worked directly over Ramirez. So they couldn't rule out that there was a poison, but they thought the most likely explanation was a case of mass hysteria. How did the emergency room staff react to that? Not well. Emergency room workers are trained to deal with emergencies, and they have to work well under pressure. They are not faint-hearted and not likely to start fainting on the job. And some of them had long-lasting physical symptoms after the event. Dr. Julie Gorchinsky spent two weeks in an intensive care unit, and she developed multiple physical conditions that couldn't be explained as psychological. These included hepatitis, which is an inflammation of the liver, pancreatitis, which is inflammation of the pancreas, and avascular necrosis, which is where your bone tissue starts to die because it isn't getting enough blood. In Dr. Gorchinsky's case, the necrosis appeared in her knees, and she reportedly had to have 20 surgeries on her knees. She did not feel that she was a victim of a psychologically induced illness. Gorchinsky and her lawyer, physician Russell Cussman, denounced the mass hysteria conclusion. By this time, Gorchinsky had filed a lawsuit against Riverside General Hospital, the coroner's office, and several others, seeking $6 million in damages. 
A report suggesting Gorchinsky experienced psychosomatic symptoms would certainly not play well for her in court. The report may be based on politics or ignorance, but it's not based on science, Kessman told the New York Times. These are all professional emergency room workers. They don't become hysterical because of a heart attack. Another staffer who strongly objected to the mass hysteria diagnosis was the respiratory therapist Maureen Welch. She had fainted, and then when she woke up, she'd been unable to control the movements of her limbs. But she decided that the parties in California had a vested interest in coming to certain conclusions. After all, they didn't want to be found legally liable for the hospital not taking proper precautions to protect its staff and patients. Nor did public officials want a scandal that would result if the hospital were somehow to blame. Gloria's family also were outraged by the reputation their loved one was getting in press reports being called the toxic lady or the toxic woman. Indeed, the family believed that what happened when Gloria was taken to the emergency room had nothing to do with Gloria and everything to do with unsafe conditions at the hospital. So the state authorities had a vested interest in coming to the conclusion that Gloria died a natural death and that the staff just happened to suffer a case of mass hysteria. Since the local authorities had conflicts of interests, Maureen Welch decided to reach back out to Lawrence Livermore and ask them to take another look at the case. Eventually, they agreed to do so, and the Forensic Center's director, Brian Andreessen, and his deputy director, Pat Grant, re-examined it. Now, you'll recall that one of the chemicals they found in Gloria's body was dimethyl sulfone. When he started looking at the case, Pat Grant began wondering if a very similar chemical that is just one oxygen atom different, could be involved in the case. Instead of being dimethyl sulfone, this one is dimethyl sulfide, or DMSO. I'd use DMSO in a former life as an athlete, Grant said. DMSO is sold in a gel form at hardware stores as a heavy-duty degreaser, and it has long been a folk remedy among athletes for achy muscles and joints. One thing that particularly struck him was a speculation in the autopsy report about the source of the garlicky odor of Ramirez's body and its oily sheen, DMSO. DMSO has a checkered past. During the mid-1960s, a flurry of research showed it had remarkable healing powers, easing intractable pain and reducing anxiety. But the rise of this potential wonder drug was stopped suddenly when animal tests showed that prolonged exposure to DMSO altered the lens of the eye. Fearing that a DMSO drug might ruin people's eyesight, the Food and Drug Administration ordered companies to cease clinical trials of the drug in 1965. The FDA later relaxed that policy and in 1978 approved a 50% solution of DMSO as a treatment for interstitial cystitis, a condition that occurs predominantly in women. Meanwhile, over the past 30 years, DMSO gained an underground following as a home remedy. Not only did Grant use it, but Andreessen as well remembers the DMSO rage from his days during the 1970s as a pharmacology professor at Ohio State University. It seemed that everybody in the athletic department was using DMSO on injuries, he recalls. Nor has its use been limited to athletes. People use it for a variety of ailments, from arthritis to muscular strains, says George Rutherford, California's state epidemiologist. But given its potential side effects, it's a dangerous remedy because in its readily available hardware-stored grease-cutting form, it's 99% pure. Alarmed by the growing cult of DMSO users, the FDA issued a warning to physicians in 1980, counsel patients against purchasing DMSO of unknown quality and medicating themselves. So the idea was, perhaps Gloria had been medicating herself using DMSO to help control the pain from her cancer, and this was responsible for the oily sheen on her body. Also, it could explain the garlicky odor that the ER staff reported, and DMSO can interact with oxygen and pick up a new oxygen atom and become dimethyl sulfone, the chemical they found in Gloria's body. It doesn't sound like either DMSO or dimethyl sulfone is particularly dangerous, at least not in a way that would cause people in the ER to start becoming ill and passing out. That's right. So Pat Grant started doing research on other related chemicals, 
and he found a promising one. If you add one oxygen atom to DMSO, you get dimethyl sulfone. But if you add three oxygen atoms, you get dimethyl sulfate. And this one is really nasty. Vapors of dimethyl sulfate kill cells in exposed tissues, such as the eyes, mouth, and lungs. When absorbed into the body, dimethyl sulfate causes convulsions, delirium, paralysis, coma, and delayed damage to the kidneys, liver, and heart. In severe cases, the vapors kill. Like many other chemicals, dimethyl sulfate has a good side and a bad side. Industries use dimethyl sulfate to tack methyl groups onto organic chemicals, but dimethyl sulfate is also a war gas. A classified Department of Defense document issued in 1987 called the Reference Book on Chemical Warfare Information reported that a 10-minute exposure to half a gram of dimethyl sulfate dispersed in a cubic meter of air can kill a person. Although dimethyl sulfate has been tested as a nerve gas, it has apparently never been manufactured for use in war. The match between the symptoms experienced by the hospital staff and the symptoms of dimethyl sulfate exposure was uncanny. Of the 20 types of symptoms reported by the staff, from the fainting to the convulsions to Gorchinsky's hepatitis, only one, nausea and vomiting, is not a symptom of dimethyl sulfate exposure. When there is such a nice match on the symptoms, that was the first indication that we might really have had something, Grant says. In addition to the idea that Gloria had been using DMSO as a pain medication, the Livermore team also thought of another possibility for how she could have come into contact with it. In this scenario, Ramirez spread a cream on her skin that contained phencyclidine, better known as PCP or angel dust, dissolved in a DMSO carrier base, a common way to take the drug. According to an August report on the Riverside incident by Tam Smallstig, an industrial hygienist with California's Department of Industrial Relations, the Riverside coroner's office had told the department, without elaborating, that Ramirez's body had indications consistent with phencyclidine use. This scenario would explain the presence of the nicotinamide that Andreessen had found in Ramirez's blood and tissues. It had been mixed in with the PCP to extend it. But if Ramirez had taken PCP, someone should have found some traces of the drug itself. No one had, and so the Livermore team decided that this scenario was impossible. They therefore turned to the theory that she had been using DMSO itself to relieve the pain of the cancer. They theorized that when the paramedics put an oxygen mask on Gloria, the oxygen flooded her bloodstream and combined with the DMSO to form dimethyl sulfone, the still relatively harmless chemical. To see how much dimethyl sulfone could accumulate in blood, they did an experiment with a bag of Ringer's solution, which is a liquid that's chemically similar to blood but doesn't have the red blood cells in it. They heated the bag to body temperature and then tried to see how much dimethyl sulfone they could dissolve in it. They then cooled it to room temperature to see what would happen. When they cooled a vial of this Ringer's solution crammed with dimethyl sulfone to room temperature, about 70 degrees, they were greeted by a good sign. The solution became supersaturated, and dimethyl sulfone began to form beautiful white crystals, says Whipple, who did the experiment with Grant. In real blood, those crystals might have appeared manila-colored. Thus, this process could have produced the crystals that had been observed in the syringe in the hospital, particularly since emergency rooms tend to be cooler than most rooms, about 66 degrees. So they had a possible explanation for the crystals that were seen in the syringe. But dimethyl sulfone is still relatively harmless. How could it have become the nerve gas dimethyl sulfate? They speculated that the sulfone broke down in Gloria's blood and then recombined into sulfate. While in the body, this compound would be unstable and would quickly break down, which is why they didn't find sulfate afterwards. But when the blood was drawn, they theorized, the cool air of the emergency room allowed it to become stable, and some of it vaporized and affected the staff. So the Livermore people contacted the Riverside coroner's office and proposed this as a tentative theory and said that more investigation should be done. But the coroner's office turned around and told the public that the Livermore team had found the solution, which caught the Livermore team totally off guard. According to the forensics director, Brian Andreessen, We just wanted the coroner's office's opinion. Then they took it and said, this is the answer. It caught us way off guard. 
We've never said this is what happened, just that people should look into it, and people still go nuts. And people were going nuts, because now a new controversy started. Before we get to that in our theories and reason and faith perspectives, I want to take a moment to thank our patients who make this show possible, including Claudia S., James K., Alfredo B., Ed B., and Mary V. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by rosaryarmy.com. Have more peace. Visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all-twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. And by Whole Mission Marquette Method Natural Family Planning Services. Unveil the mystery of you and your spouse's combined fertility using an evidence-based, highly effective, and moral way of avoiding or achieving pregnancy. Discover more from a licensed healthcare professional at mmnfp.com. Jimmy, what theories are there about the medical mystery of Gloria Ramirez? There are two types of theories that we need to cover. The first are the theories regarding why Gloria died. And the second are the theories regarding what happened to the emergency room staff. Regarding the first topic, we've already heard the official theory of why Gloria died, that it was a failure of her heart to beat properly caused by kidney failure due to her cancer. Regarding the second topic, we've heard two theories. The initial theory that it was mass hysteria that affected the ER staff, and the second that it was a chemical reaction that produced dimethyl sulfate that did. But there are other theories on both of these topics that we'll need to consider. Finally, depending on what the reason perspective reveals, we'll need to consider some questions from the faith perspective. What can we say about this medical mystery from the reason perspective? Which topic would you like to consider first, Gloria's death or what happened to the ER staff? The latter, because we'll be in a better position to examine the theories about her death once we look at the theories concerning the staff. All right. Besides the mass hysteria and dimethyl sulfate theories, what other ideas are there about what the staff experienced? Well, on the X-Files episode that this incident helped inspire, people were affected by chemicals coming from a person who had been genetically engineered with alien DNA. I don't have any evidence that anything like that was in play here. (laughs) Sure. Neither do I have evidence for any other kind of paranormal explanation. So I think that the ultimate solution is going to be a natural one, even if it's a weird one. All right. What about the mass hysteria theory? I find it unlikely that two dozen out of the three dozen ER workers would succumb to mass hysteria. They really are trained to function under pressure and need strong hearts and stomachs to do their jobs. Also, the conditions that Dr. Gorchinsky developed afterwards clearly point to something physiological rather than psychological. There are psychosomatic conditions where the mind affects the body, but Those don't typically include sudden inflammation of the liver, sudden inflammation of the pancreas, and the loss of adequate blood flow to the bones in your knees. Maybe she had one of these conditions before the incident and it just happened to be discovered immediately afterwards, but it's implausible to hold that a young woman like this simultaneously had three such undiscovered conditions, which would suggest they were caused by the emergency room experience. And then there are the other effects she suffered, including the apnea or cessation of breathing that she started suffering, as well as the ongoing hoarseness she had, suggesting exposure to some kind of irritant. You can hear it in her voice days after the event. Julie was often hooked up to a breathing machine because she would suddenly stop breathing. This week, she has been feeling much better. It's great to go to sleep and be reassured that you're going to wake up without having anybody breathing for you. Just laying in bed here, I kind of feel like a 90-year-old lady. My lungs still aren't up to par. You know, I just brush my hair and I'm very exhausted. And they don't really keep you in the intensive care unit for two weeks unless they found something physically wrong with you. I mean, they do tests, and if the tests don't show something seriously wrong, they move you out of the ICU. 
ICU beds are at a premium, and they want to free them up for people who really need them. So I'm very skeptical of the mass hysteria explanation. What about the idea that Gloria was using PCP as a drug or DMSO as a pain reliever, and that this got converted into dimethyl sulfate? For a start, Gloria's family denied that she was using either of these substances. Now, they could be lying to protect her reputation and that of the family, but they could also be telling the truth, and no proof ever emerged that Gloria was using either of these substances, which supports their version of the story. Then there's the controversy that ensued when the Riverside coroner announced his theory as the solution. Suffice it to say that the theory got a lot of pushback from chemists. This was what caused the new controversy. Many of the chemists said that the proposed reaction that would convert DMSO into dimethyl sulfate in this situation, and that this is what took out the ER staffers, is flatly impossible. However, others were open to the idea, even though it was an unprecedented reaction that hadn't happened before or since, and that has not been duplicated in a lab. I won't walk you through all the back and forth arguments about why it's impossible or why it might be possible, but the bottom line is that the scientific community is divided on whether this theory could explain what happened to the ER staff. It is at best a tentative proposal rather than a clear and obvious solution, just like the people on the Livermore team said it was. What other theory should we consider? You'll recall that Gloria's family never bought what the hospital was saying about how Gloria died. That's why they had an independent autopsy done. But their pathologist couldn't determine what the cause of death was due to the state of the body. Basically, the family suspected that something was wrong at the hospital, and they were covering it up. Was there evidence of a cover-up? Well, yeah, there was a pattern of facts that you could read as evidence that the hospital and the county authorities were trying to hush something up. For example, you'll recall that when the staff drew Gloria's blood, they saw crystals form in the syringe. That syringe should be a key piece of evidence in any investigation, as you could look inside it and find out what those crystals were. But, according to New Times L.A., Almost immediately after Ramirez's death, crucial evidence began disappearing. The syringe used to draw her blood couldn't be found. After dodging questions over its whereabouts for several weeks, Riverside County spokesman Tom DeSantis finally confirmed it was missing. He told reporters it did not occur to the fire department to retrieve it the night of February 19th. But nurse Sally Jo McCorkle, the last person to handle the syringe that night, said in sworn testimony in the Ramirez lawsuit, that the fire department's hazardous materials specialists did inquire about the needle. McCorkle said that she was asked by both the hazmat crew and her supervisor where exactly she had disposed of the syringe and how they could find it. So the hazmat team and Nurse McCorkle's boss asked where the syringe was, and then it vanished. The blood taken from Ramirez at the hospital before she died also disappeared, according to notes obtained by New Times that were written by Tom Hanley. Southern California Regional Manager for Cal OSHA. Meanwhile, Ramirez's IV bag, another possible source of the fumes, was sent to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for testing, according to Riverside Chief Deputy Coroner Cupido. But Cupido recently acknowledged in a deposition that he never bothered to follow up with the FDA, failing to call and find out whether the bag had indeed been tested. An FDA spokeswoman refused to confirm whether her agency received or tested the bag. Other materials, IV tubing, towels, bedding, and clothing worn by the ER staff were packed into barrels and sent to a desert waste facility where they baked in the sun for the next several months, according to a deposition by Kent Livingston, the county's risk manager. No tests were performed on the materials. Livingston said that when he went to the desert dump to look over the evidence four months after Ramirez died, he discovered that none of it had been tagged and that nearly all of it was spoiled. There were no labels on any of the items in there, he said. It was as though they had collected up bags, red bags filled with items, thrown them in a barrel, sealed the barrel, and shipped it. I can honestly say that everything I saw out there is useless except for a couple of items. Despite the high-profile nature of the Ramirez case, the county did not have a chain of custody indicating who was in charge of what evidence and when, Livingston said. 
He also admitted that no one made any effort to figure out how the evidence should be preserved. So at a minimum, we have severe mishandling and disappearance of evidence. That's consistent with both the idea of widespread incompetence and with the idea of a cover-up. And then there's what happened six days after Gloria's death, on the night when they were just about to do Gloria's first autopsy, which involved a collaboration between the county coroner's office and Cal OSHA, which had helped with the special autopsy chamber. Inside the office, Charles Cox, a Cal OSHA district manager, and Tom Krenchevich, a Cal OSHA inspector, looked over the autopsy chamber and emergency standby equipment, checking that everything was in order. They had helped design the autopsy plan and had carefully gone over it with coroner's officials a few days earlier. It was their job to ensure that the people who entered the chamber were protected as well as possible, and by law, that autopsy couldn't start until they gave the go-ahead. But shortly before it was supposed to begin, Riverside County Coroner Scotty Hill ordered the Cal OSHA men to leave. Cox and Krenchevich protested, saying they were there in compliance with state law, and the autopsy couldn't move forward without their okay. Their protests made no difference. At Hill's request, a Riverside police sergeant escorted Cox and Krenchevich off the property. It was at that moment, recalls Cox, a 12-year Cal OSHA veteran, that everything about the Ramirez case seemed to change. I had never encountered such hostility in all my years with Cal OSHA, he says. As we were being led off the property by the police sergeant, I had the feeling that something very serious had occurred at that hospital, and the coroner knew what it was. They wanted us out of there because they were afraid we might find out what really happened at the hospital that night. So despite state law requiring the Cal OSHA people to give the go order for the autopsy, the coroner ordered them to leave and had the police escort them off the premises before they approved the procedure. Then there's what happened when the family tried to get Gloria's body back for their own autopsy. For a month after she died, bereaved relatives regularly called the coroner's office asking when her body would be released. The family wanted an independent autopsy done on the body, and after that, they wanted to bury it. The response by county officials? They sued the family. The county wanted a judge to order the family to follow the same extraordinary autopsy protocol the coroner's office had as a condition of releasing the body. But it came out during court hearings on the lawsuit that the coroner's office had secretly performed a second autopsy several weeks after Ramirez died without bothering to follow many of the original protective measures they later demanded of the family. Under pressure to explain their actions, coroner's officials said they simply were finishing what they hadn't the first time around. But Cal OSHA's Cox believes they had another motive. When they did the second autopsy, they wanted to make sure the chemicals Ramirez had been injected with or exposed to had sufficiently dissipated, says Cox. There are many chemicals that have a half-life and disappear over time. So the county sued the grieving family to try to get them to follow the same elaborate procedures that had been used in Gloria's first autopsy, which would have the effect of making it much more expensive and much more difficult to do the autopsy and thus discourage the new autopsy from ever happening. And then it emerged that the county itself had done a secret second autopsy in which they didn't follow their own procedures. And a logical motive for the second autopsy would be to make sure that the chemicals that could incriminate the hospital in the county had deteriorated to the point they weren't detectable. Even though county officials acted as if it were normal to conduct an autopsy in two acts, others say it is not standard procedure. Normally, we do autopsies all at one time, says Scott Carrier, a spokesman for the L.A. County Coroner's Office. A veteran pathologist should be able to do an autopsy all in one setting. During one hearing on the county's suit, Riverside Superior Court Judge Victor Michelli criticized coroner's officials for conducting the second autopsy and not informing the Ramirez family so their pathologist could attend. The county's actions, said Michelli, gave the appearance to the public that the county is trying to hide something. The judge then ordered county officials to answer questions under oath about the Ramirez investigation. Only hours before they were to begin doing so, the county abruptly withdrew its suit. So when the judge observed that the county appeared to be hiding something and ordered officials to answer questions under oath, 
they abruptly dropped the lawsuit to compel the family to follow the same procedures used in the first publicly known autopsy. They then released the body, and the family brought in an outside pathologist from Orange County to do what would now be a third autopsy. But he couldn't determine the cause of death because the body was now badly decomposed, all of the organs had been mixed together and contaminated with fecal matter, and most strangely, the heart was missing. And the heart is a rather important piece of evidence to have if you're claiming the patient died because of a heart issue. In 1997, New Times LA reported, Even today, three years later, Ramirez's heart has not been released by the county. Asked during a deposition if there was any medical reason to keep it, Coroner Hill replied, I don't know of any. So the county took the heart and didn't give it back. Also, the Kalosha men who were investigating the fumes got yanked off the case because of complaints from the county coroner. Two weeks after Ramirez died, Cox and Krenchevich, the Cal OSHA officials who had been kicked out of the first autopsy, were taken off the fumes investigation. Cox was told he wasn't sensitive to the highly political nature of the case. Krenchevich, one of Cal OSHA's most aggressive enforcement officers, was told he was being removed because he'd been disruptive and uncooperative with Riverside General officials. County Coroner Hill also complained that the two Cal OSHA men had used threats and intimidation to try to delay the autopsy proceedings. The Ramirez file was then transferred to Cal OSHA's regional office in Anaheim, and a new investigator didn't set foot in the hospital for another six weeks. Even though some Cal OSHA officials believed the fumes were some kind of toxic agent, possibly as potent as poison gas. And you can disappear a lot of evidence in six weeks if you're trying to cover something up. Not long before Cox and Krenchevich were pulled off the case, Ken Cohen, head of the county's health services agency, sent a cryptic email to his staff in the message obtained by New Times. Cohen, who oversees Riverside General, ordered subordinates to keep their mouths shut about the fumes incident because of a very sensitive agreement with Cal OSHA that could be disrupted with adverse press reporting. One Cal OSHA official denied that there was any deal with the County Health Services Agency, but an attorney for the county later admitted that the deal was to pull Kranjicevitz and Koch off the case. Why would the authorities be trying to perform such a cover-up? For a start, the hospital and the county were facing millions of dollars in liability if they were found legally at fault for anything. In fact, both Gloria's family and Dr. Julie Gorchinsky sued them, with Gorchinsky asking for $6 million and the family asking for unspecified damages. Both suits charge that county and state officials deliberately destroyed evidence and covered up the release of some kind of toxic or dangerous substance in the ER. The Ramirez suit specifically names Cal OSHA, Ken Cohen, the head of Riverside County's Health Services Agency, Coroner Hill, and other high-ranking county and hospital officials. So the individual officials that we've been hearing about, like Ken Cohen and Coroner Scotty Hill, had skin in the game because they were named in one of the lawsuits. Then there's the fact that Scotty Hill was running for re-election. He was being challenged by one of his own deputy coroners and was trying to hold on to his job. At first, all the press attention worked to his advantage as it got his name and picture in the papers and on TV, so he got higher name recognition with the voters. But then, the deputy coroner he had assigned to Gloria's case, a woman named Stephanie Albright, committed suicide by shooting herself during a phone conversation with her estranged husband. And Hill's chief deputy, Dan Cupido, acknowledged to the press that she may have been under pressure due to the case. With the June election just a few weeks away, Hill finally released his conclusions about the cause of Ramirez's death, heart and kidney failure related to cancer. The fumes that sickened ER workers, he speculated to the press, were simply the smell of death. At first, the intensive news coverage had made Hill look good, a real-life Quincy, trying to solve a puzzling and difficult case. Before long, though, Hill found himself under attack. He was criticized for careless handling of Ramirez's body and for conducting the secret autopsy. In June, voters forced him into a November runoff election. With the pressure on, Hill abandoned his smell-of-death theory five days before the runoff. And that 
was when Coroner Hill suddenly announced the DMSO theory as the probable cause of the fumes, even though the team from Lawrence Livermore had only floated it as a tentative possibility that needed further investigation. In any event, both as individuals and corporately, the county officials had significant motives, both financial and personal, to cover it up if there was wrongdoing on the part of the hospital and the county. But what on earth would they have been covering up? At a minimum, unsafe conditions at the hospital. You see, this wasn't the first time that bizarre, overpowering smells had been reported. According to hospital and Cal OSHA records, sewer-like smells were regularly reported, but no source could ever be found. About a month before the ER evacuation, a cancer patient fled his room after he and his wife were overcome by noxious fumes. Dennis Weiss says the stench was so intense it made him vomit. Two days later, chemical fumes again filled his room, and again, he was forced to flee. And? Hospital records show that on the morning before Ramirez arrived, staffers again reported sewer-like odors. So the building had a history of sewer-like smells that could be overpowering and make people vomit. Could this have been a sewer leak that was sickening people, like the primary theory we covered in episode 124 on death at the National Hotel? Possibly, but they didn't find any evidence of that in health and safety inspections. Instead, the people involved in the case suspect that the smells were caused by something else. And to figure out what that might be, let's go back to the night Gloria died. You'll remember that everything was normal on the ambulance ride to the hospital. Things didn't start going weird until she got into the ER and they did two things. First, they put in an IV to give Gloria some medications. And second, they did a blood draw. Normally, when you do a blood draw, very, very little blood is ever exposed to the air, which makes the idea that it was Gloria's blood that was the problem seem doubtful. But then there's this. Standard protocol when administering IV medications is to squeeze some fluid out of the IV tubing to clear it of air bubbles, which could prove fatal to a patient. Nurse Kane inserted an IV needle into Ramirez's right arm. Then, using a separate needle, she drew a blood sample from near the IV site. As she did so, she began to smell something odd. Who popped the ammonia, Kane asked, according to a deposition she gave in the Ramirez lawsuit. Prior to starting the IV, Kane said she had not noticed any unusual odors, even though Ramirez's veins had already been punctured in the ambulance. So even though a blood draw does not result in a lot of blood coming into contact with the air, typically just a few drops, and when you pull the needle out rather than put it in, Nurse Kane had just squirted some liquid out of the tube going to the IV bag of medicines. Maybe it was that liquid that contained the toxic substance and not Gloria's blood at all. Maybe there was something in the IV bag that wasn't supposed to be there, something the team didn't expect. And since they thought they knew what was in the IV bag, they mistakenly thought the smell came from Gloria's blood. But what would have been in the bag? Methamphetamines, or rather a precursor chemical that you use to make methamphetamines. For example, it may have been the precursor known as methylamine. And as you can hear, methylamine is an amine, a derivative of ammonia, and it has an ammonia-like smell. According to New Times LA, while finished meth has no detectable smell, unless it's been poorly made, precursors commonly give off ammonia and sewer-like odors, says Tom Holman, a senior narcotics investigator with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and member of the State Justice Department's Meth Lab Task Force. And the symptoms the ER staff exhibited fit exposure to a meth precursor. Those smells and symptoms are classic to meth fume exposure, says Tom Netwall, a forensic chemist who analyzes drug lab materials for the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. All that would be consistent with a drug laboratory. Also, Lawrence Highskill, a Palm Springs ER doctor who trains federal narcotics investigators about the medical hazards of drug abuse, says that in severe cases of meth fumes exposure, victims' respiration can become so impaired that a breathing tube must be pushed down their windpipe to keep them alive. Gorchinsky had to be intubated following the fumes incident. She also had chemical burns in her nose and throat, symptoms also linked to meth fumes, experts say. So maybe someone in the hospital was running a meth lab. 
Is that at all plausible? Well, at least in the 1990s, I'm not sure about today, Riverside County was known as a meth production area. Back in 1997, New Times LA wrote, Riverside County is awash in methamphetamine and people who make it. Since 1988, more than 1,000 clandestine meth laboratories have been shut down in the county, and law enforcement officials estimate that perhaps twice as many have gone undetected. Last year, the State Bureau of Narcotic Enforcement dubbed the county the methamphetamine capital of the world. Meth labs have popped up in the most unlikely places in Riverside County. In 1995, three people were arrested for running one at a daycare center. In 1996, police found a lab at the home of a middle school teacher. But cooking meth in a medical facility? Actually, this kind of thing has happened before. The notion of a meth lab in a public hospital may sound ludicrous, but such an operation was uncovered at a public medical facility in Denver in 1990. It's a state lab where they do testing for TB, communicable diseases, urine screenings for parolees, and water pollution exams, says Tom Netwall, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation chemist. An employee at the facility worked at night, and he had set up a lab within the lab and was manufacturing meth at night. The operation was discovered after a supervisor smelled strong chemical fumes. Netwell says meth could just as easily be made at a hospital. In a hospital, you have a legitimate lab, he says. You could easily order the chemicals needed without suspicion. Also, there are not a lot of locked doors in hospital labs. Meth can be made by just about anyone with a few beakers and some solvents. Not only is the drug simple to cook, but a $500 investment in chemicals and equipment can quickly be turned into $10,000 to $12,000 worth of dope. But the process requires a variety of volatile chemicals which can explode or release noxious fumes. Facing law enforcement crackdowns, many meth cookers have resorted to making the drug in stages, carrying out different steps in different locations to elude detection. California and some other states have tried to suppress the meth trade by requiring permits to buy solvents and other chemicals needed to make it. Consequently, a lucrative black market has developed in chemical precursors that can be mixed together to make the drug. So if someone was making meth precursors in Riverside General Hospital, you'd still need a way to get them out of the building. And that's where the IV bag came in. According to Charles Cox, who was yanked off the case... It is one of those precursors that Cox, the Cal OSHA district manager, thinks was being made at Riverside General. I believe there was an intermediate product, not full meth, that was being manufactured in the hospital and then transported out to be completed elsewhere, Cox says. I think very quickly into the investigation county officials figured out there were some hospital workers running their own business on the side. I don't think anyone in the hospital knew about it at the time other than those involved. But as a result of this incident, They found out what was going on and decided to cover everything up. It's the only plausible scenario to explain what happened. Cox says he thinks precursor chemicals were surreptitiously packaged in IV bags to be smuggled out of the hospital. So one of the bags containing the precursor liquid ended up in the ER, and Nurse Kane unwittingly took it to use it to help Gloria. First, she squeezed out some of the toxic fluid it contained, you know, out of the line to prevent Gloria from getting an air bubble in her veins. That exposed the staff to the chemical. And then she started the drip into Gloria, pumping the toxic chemical directly into Gloria's bloodstream. And that may be what killed Gloria. And that would cost the county millions and cause a huge public scandal. And that's what led to the cover-up. And that's why evidence started disappearing. And that's why they fought giving the body back to the family. And that's why they did the secret second autopsy to see if incriminating chemicals were still detectable in the body. And that's why the body was in such bad condition and why they never gave back her heart. At least... That's the theory. If there was a meth precursor in the IV bag, it should be easy to test for that. Yeah, it should. But as we mentioned before, the IV bag has disappeared. Deputy Coroner Cupido said that the bag had been sent to the Food and Drug Administration for testing, but he never followed up to see if it was tested, and the FDA refuses to confirm whether they had received or tested the bag. So, Maybe the bag used to treat Gloria was sent to the FDA, or maybe a bag, but not the one used to treat Gloria, was sent, or maybe it got lost. 
In any event, today we have no bag and no test results. Is there anything else that could be tested that could support or refute the meth precursor theory? Yes. Tests on blood drawn from Ramirez, Korchinski, and Nurse Balderas showed something both rare and puzzling. Elevated levels of cyanide. To date, government researchers haven't been able to explain where the highly toxic agent came from. But Ed Brown, a Bay Area chemist and meth specialist who provides expert testimony in criminal trials involving drugs, says the elevated cyanide levels, plus Gorchinsky's breathing problems, could be explained by exposure to methylamine, a toxic ingredient of meth with a strong ammonia odor. High concentrations of methylamine can cause a volatile vapor which is very caustic and causes headaches, dizziness, burning in the eyes and throat. It is also a respiratory tract irritant, says Brown, president of Brown's Chemistry Services in Lafayette. Methylamine can be metabolized by the body and converted to cyanide. And New Times LA itself had a new test run. At Gloria's first autopsy, they saved some of the air inside the body bag, and at first... The researchers didn't know what to make of what they found in it. Another mystery state researchers failed to solve was the identity of a vapor found in the body bag that contained Ramirez's corpse. Researchers claimed it was something not in their chemical libraries. But Alexander Shulgin, a former University of California at Berkeley professor of forensic toxicology, analyzed the formula for the gas at New Times' request and found it matched a couple of amine compounds. One of them is a meth precursor that also has a strong ammonia scent. This formula is completely chemically compatible with amyl amine, a precursor chemical used to make meth, says Shulgin, a consultant to the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. He adds that he was able to figure out what it was so quickly that he doubted if state investigators made a serious effort. So that could have been another part of the cover-up, and potentially what tipped the coroner's office off that meth was involved. When Gloria's body was examined, the state officials, or Gloria's family when they finally got to do an independent autopsy, did they find evidence of meth precursors? No, but there are reasonable explanations for that. Tests on Ramirez's body failed to detect meth or other illegal drugs, government officials said. But toxicologists consulted by New Times say a decomposing body produces substances that could make detection of meth difficult or impossible. Moreover, drug analysts don't screen for meth precursors when they test for finished meth, says Jim Meeker, chief toxicologist at the Institute of Forensic Sciences in Oakland, a private lab that does work for police agencies around the state. Experts also suggest another possible explanation for the negative meth screen that the samples of blood and tissue tested didn't come from Ramirez. Says Meeker, If someone died of a catastrophic meth overdose and you wanted to hide that from toxicologists, the best way to do it would be to send off phony samples to labs. According to Ramirez family attorney Schwartz, no DNA testing was ever done on the samples sent out by the county for analysis to confirm that they had come from Ramirez. Therefore, he says, there is no guarantee that the samples are valid. What's the case against the idea that someone in the hospital was making meth precursors? I'm aware of two arguments that could be made. First, if the meth lab was a small operation that county officials didn't know about, why would they cover it up? Why not just hang the people responsible out to dry, you know, haul them into court and prosecute them? One possibility is that it wasn't just a small, unknown, illegal operation in the hospital. If the State Bureau of Narcotic Enforcement was correct in saying that Riverside County was the methamphetamine capital of the world, you would expect the criminal enterprise to have its tendrils extending into local authorities. In other words, you'd expect at least some local corruption. So maybe one or more key county officials was corrupt and needed to initiate the cover-up for that reason. Or maybe one or more of them were intimidated by criminals into keeping this quiet. I've never seen Breaking Bad, but I'm guessing that both of those scenarios have played out on the show. And I can imagine other reasons that the cover-up might start, so I'm not convinced by this argument. I've seen Breaking Bad, and this sounds a lot like that. So, Jimmy, what's the second argument against the cover-up theory? It's the number of agencies that were involved. 
Peter Osanoff, a Los Angeles lawyer representing Cohen and the county health agency, denies there was a meth lab in the hospital or that county officials covered it up. There have never been so many government agencies looking into the same thing, he says. He had the county, OSHA, the state. There's not a shred of evidence as to a cover-up. Except there is a pattern of facts that is suggestive of a cover-up. That includes not only all of the evidence disappearing and being mishandled and the secret autopsy, there's also evidence of secret backroom deals between agencies to yank people off the case, like Charlie Cox of Cal OSHA. And Cox later became convinced that there was a cover-up of meth precursors being cooked at the hospital. The pattern of evidence suggestive of a cover-up is so strong that when the county sued the Ramirez family, the judge even pointed it out, after which the county quickly dropped their lawsuit. So I'm not convinced by this argument either. What ended up happening with the lawsuits? Dr. Gorchinsky ended up losing her lawsuit. She could not prove that the hospital and the county were at fault for what happened to her, which could be for any number of reasons, including that the cover-up was effective in shielding them from provable liability. However, the county ended up settling out of court with Gloria's family and eventually gave them $350,000, which would be, you know, even more than that today, though they didn't admit any wrongdoing. Their attorney said that they settled in part to avoid stirring up allegations about safety hazards at the hospital. You think? (laughs) Right. So what can we say about what happened to Gloria Ramirez from the faith perspective? It depends on which theory about what happened is true. If this was a case where a bizarre, unpredictable chemical reaction occurred, then nobody is at fault because no one could have predicted it, and so there's not much to say. On the other hand, if there was criminal wrongdoing at the hospital and the county then conducted a cover-up, there's also not much to say because those courses of action are so obviously wrong they don't need to be belabored. Either way, the case of Gloria Ramirez was tragic, and we should pray for the repose of her soul and for the family she left behind, including her children. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the case of Gloria Ramirez? They reportedly have a saying that they teach students in medical schools on how to diagnose puzzling cases. The saying goes, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. In other words, assume the more common explanation of the symptoms is correct unless you've got really good evidence for an exotic explanation. In this case, one explanation is an exotic chemical reaction that has never happened before or since and that nobody has duplicated in a lab. Another explanation is that someone in the hospital was making meth precursors in the methamphetamine capital of the world. In other words, committing a crime in a county that was famous for that crime. While I think it would be fascinating if this case involved an exotic, unprecedented chemical reaction, and I can't prove that there wasn't, I suspect that the meth explanation is much more likely to be true. Before we go, I want to say a special word of thanks to a couple of the mysterious irregulars. Dr. Thomas Carroll, MD, reviewed our discussion to see if there were any medical errors in it. And Dr. Adam Nolte, who is a chemical engineering professor, also reviewed it. Incidentally, his opinion and that of an organic chemist who's an expert in biochemical pharmacology that he consulted with is that the Livermore theory that had DMSO turning into dimethyl sulfate is improbable, that there is just no reasonable way for this chemical reaction to happen in the human body because it's not as simple as adding oxygen atoms. The structure of the molecule has to be fundamentally altered. And in my view, the fact that the DMSO to sulfate theory is so improbable makes the methamphetamine hypothesis much more probable. Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners on this? We'll have a Discover Magazine article on all of this, as well as the New Times LA article that we've been quoting from, also Wikipedia's article, a link to the 2020 report, also a page on the X-Files episode, The Erlenmeyer Flask, that this inspired or partly inspired, as well as a link to season one of The X-Files on Amazon. 
Great. And also thanks to my wife, Melanie, for helping out with a lot of the uh, reading of the various texts. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I want to uh, now move on to our mysterious feedback. And as I said, our feedback is going to be about a, a lot of great fan art we've been getting. I'm really impressed by the artistic abilities of our audience uh, here. And so let's start with the first one. Lindsay P. writes, My husband, a recent Catholic convert, and I are big fans of Catholic Answers and uh, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. We have so much respect for you and your work. I like to crochet and sometimes make dolls of people I admire, and you are my latest subject. I will attach a picture of my work below and would love to send this to you as a token of my appreciation. And Lindsay did send it. It's a really nice crochet figure of me. It's similar to the Amigurumi one that I got previously. And it's interesting to see how the two takes are are very similar and very different at the same time. We'll have pictures of all of the fan art from this episode on my website, and we'll have a link in the further resources that you can just click so you can see all of the fan art we're talking about. It's a really cute uh, little figure, almost kind of like a bobblehead, but made out of yarn instead of plastic. And it's really nice. Yes. Yeah, very cute. Dan L. writes, Hey, Jimmy and Dom, thanks for the great episode. My nine-year-old daughter Eve drew you this drop bear while we listened. Thank you for making a great family-friendly show. And she's got a nice uh, colored pencil drawing of a, it's called Drop Bear Attack, exclamation point. <laughs> and it shows a person, it looks like maybe her walking in the forest and being horrified at a drop bear that is dropping out of a tree near her with its big dark claws extended. Fortunately, she has a couple of dogs with her, one of which is already leaping to her defense and ready to drop, ready to bite the drop bear as soon as it hits the ground. Yes. The, the defending dr dogs. Nice. Uh, Heather C. writes, I found this episode on drop bears inspiring. I made an Emigurumi one. And it is such a cute amigurumi drop bear. It has, you know, gray fur with uh, white ears and black claws and big scowly red and black eyes and a cute little koala nose. So it's uh, both cute and fearsome. Yeah, you could sell those on Etsy, Heather. You really you, could. <laughs> you really could. These are awesome. It is awesome. Sign me up. <laughs> so that's our mysterious feedback. Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines? Well, since we just talked about drop bears, which are a imaginary cryptid, <laughs> I thought we would continue to talk about cryptids a little bit of animals not currently known to exist. But these are real. These are not jokes. The first one we have is a story about, believe it or not, the Brazilian sand octopus, which has been rediscovered after 170 years. Now, even though it's called a sand octopus, it doesn't live in deserts. That would be really cool, but <laughs> it's a, it's called that because it buries itself in the sand when it's threatened. And so that's its retreat technique. And so Brazilian fishermen have actually known about this all the time, but it was initially discovered uh, 170 years ago, and then the samples went missing. And they're, you know, because you need a voucher specimen in order to prove something's existence, well, the voucher specimens disappeared. And so there came to be doubt about, well, was this really its own species or was it something that had been misidentified? But now the Brazilian sand octopus has been rediscovered, and you can read all about that as well as see a picture of it. It's an interesting looking octopus. And there are other creatures that, you know, have, have been known to exist, but then disappeared. And recently, we found fossils that are 120 million years old of the very first two species of scratch diggers that are known to have existed. Scratch diggers, it's a kind of lifestyle that things like gophers lead, you know, where they scratch out and dig a, a burrow for themselves. And so these are the oldest scratch digger fossils we found of species that existed back, you know, during dinosaur days. So check those out. And also the name Scratch Digger is awesome. <laughs> it's a great name. All right. That's it from us this time. So what do you think about this medical mystery concerning Gloria Ramirez? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. Send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of 
Mysterious Feedback. Folks, be sure to follow Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World in Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or at the StarQuest YouTube channel where you should hit the bell to get notifications. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines in our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Yakin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. Once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World on StarQuest.